Hello YouTube, this is Remarkable Republican here to bring you the truth with truth flavored bias. And today we're going to begin a new video series in honor of the new year. That video series is called True History. And today we're going to do a complete look at the war of northern aggression. Or as some call it, the war between the states. Or as some call it, the American Civil War. But at any rate, I'm going to go through the entirety of the war and tell you what really happened, not the kind of bullshit that people give you in school or in the fake news media. There's been a lot of demagoguing the issue of what caused the Civil War. A lot of people say slavery, 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 and they're completely wrong. The real underlying issue is states' rights. The South believed in them, the North did not. Each side had a fundamentally different view of the Constitution. Now, Congress was dominated by the North because they loaded their country up with immigrants. So the North had a lot of people, and therefore they held more seats in Congress. And that meant that the North then got to decide who paid what taxes, and then they levied all the heavy taxes on the South. So farmers in the South were paying way more taxes than factory workers in the North. There also were other economic disagreements. So the North was protectionist because they were making things and they wanted other people to be forced to buy them, whereas the South believed in free trade and free markets, and they believed that it was their right to buy any good or service that they wanted. So there was a fundamental ideological difference over states' rights and over economic policies where the South had one vision and the North had a more authoritarian vision. Now, Lincoln was elected in 1860. He was a known radical abolitionist, and someone who had a deep hatred for the South. He was a self-hating Kentuckian. He was elected president in 1860, and the South knew that they were in for some real shit if he actually got into power and proceeded to destroy them and further the interests of the North at the expense of the South. So the South decided to call it quits and form their own country. And that is why it is the war of Northern aggression and not simply the war between the states or the Civil War. Let's take a look at the varying strengths of both sides. So the North had more railroads, factories, people, and money, and those are all very good advantages to have. The South, however, had more farmland. So the South usually was able to supply itself with most of the crops it needed until towards the end of the war when Sherman started burning down Georgia. And the South also had some rugged terrain going for it, so there were many places in the South that were hard to assault, and that's part of why it took the North so long to destroy the South. Both countries suffered from fifth columns. There were blacks in the South who were not loyal to the flag, and in the North there were rioters in big cities like New York and Boston, and there were also COs, which stands for conscientious, conscientious objector. It really should be OC, outright coward, but anyway, that was the North's cross to bear. So based on what we saw above, it's clear that the North had the overall advantage. They had more people and resources. So why did the war go so long and why was it such a hard fight? Well, the South had a lot of intangibles on its side. Most of its soldiers were good old farm boys rather than factory workers like up North. They were men who were used to living hard and being resourceful. They had a greater love of country. They cared a lot more about their flag, the stars and bars, than the North cared about its flag, the stars and stripes. They were mostly better shots. Again, these are rural farmers and they, like their modern descendants, are more interested in guns than northern people. There also were more West Point graduates in the South. People don't realize it, but the South was actually a lot better educated than the North at this time. There were also a lot of plantation owners in the South, and these men were all natural leaders. Um, leading a plantation is very difficult because you always have to worry about being assassinated by one of your slaves and that means that you have to have a lot of charisma and you have to be able to inspire both fear and respect in your subordinates. Um, the South had the advantage of having a less diverse population so men in the ranks could easily understand one another. They all shared similar ideas and values and there was more overall Christian brotherhood. And that's not to say that there weren't Christians up North. There were plenty of Christians in the Northern Army but they just weren't as Christian, and they didn't have the same degree of um, Christian brotherhood that we see in the Southern Army. There's been a lot of Yankee propaganda about the true nature of the Confederate government, so I'm just going to set the record straight. The Confederate Constitution 
is basically a lot like the U.S. Constitution, except that it has fewer problems and that it returns the original principles and emphasizes the role of patriotism. Now, this is not a racist government, no matter what anybody tells you, and the proof of that is that there was a Jew who was Secretary of State named Judah P. Benjamin. Had this been a racist government, I doubt they would have allowed a Jew to be like the third highest person in the government. The Confederacy consisted of the following states, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Let's take a look at the state of warfare in the 1860s. Now by the 1860s, muskets were the normal infantry weapon. Before that time, muskets had already been in heavy use, but they had been supplemented by slower firing rifles and there were still dudes walking around with pikes and all kinds of crazy stuff. But by this point, there are enough factories around that everybody can have a musket. At this time, we also see that cannons and mortars are becoming more effective, more accurate, and heavier. So they are getting better and they will cause more casualties than in previous wars. We also see that by this point there are trains and railroads all across America and that these trains can really facilitate the movement of men and material around the country more easily. It's also at this point, you know, several hundred years into musket combat where volley tactics where you really mass a volley of muskets are fully mastered. And this is done by Lee and others, most like all the great generals of the Civil War, Lee, Jackson, um, all those guys really mastered the mass volley tactics. And um, after this point, this will be the last war when these mass volley tactics will be really effective. After this, um, uh, muskets will be replaced by better rifles, and then you know they have to uh, change up the tactics. But anyway, this is sort of the peak of musket warfare, and this is sort of classical musket warfare. So, the South seceded and it formed its own government, but the North still held on to forts which were in the South, the most famous of which was Fort Sumner and the Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. Now, when the Union refused to surrender it, they refused to recognize the sovereignty of South Carolina and the new Confederacy. So, that meant that they were effectively declaring war and declaring a part of this sovereign territory of South Carolina to be seized and conquered. Well, that didn't sit well with the Confederate government, as you might well imagine, since they were legally in the right. So, General Beauregard was forced to uphold Confederate sovereignty, and he opened fire on Fort Sumner, and that is the beginning of the war. Of course, the Yankees at Fort Sumner surrendered, and the first victory went to the south. There were six major fronts in the War of Northern Aggression. There was Northern Virginia, there was Kentucky slash Tennessee, Missouri, Texas, the Mississippi River, and the coastal ports of the South. But the only important fronts were Northern Virginia and the protection of coastal ports. Northern Virginia is where the capital was, so that had to be defended at all costs. That was the only part of the South that was completely indispensable. And the ports were where the South could import some of the things that it couldn't produce for itself, such as infield rifles from the British. Now, as is well known, wars are won and lost by defending your capital and taking the enemy's capital. So, by positioning their capital at Richmond, the Confederates ensured that they had to hold Northern Virginia at all costs, but they also always gave themselves a puncher's chance of taking Washington, D.C. and ending the war at a stroke. So let's get to First Manassas, the first major battle of the Civil War which was fought in Northern Virginia. Now, both sides had newly raised troops, and neither side was very well equipped or trained by this point. And both sides are trying to probe around and find the other's army. What happens is that a northern force runs into General Beauregard in northern Virginia at Manassas Junction, and a battle is fought, where the Confederates eventually rout a larger Union force. This is the battle where Stonewall Jackson first emerges as a hero, when he and his brigade are standing firm, and then General Beauregard cries out to the other men to go behind Jackson, who is formed up like a stone wall. So, Lincoln was displeased with what had happened at First Manassas, so he decided that the army needed to be better organized. So, he gave command of what was now called the Army of the Potomac to George McClellan, who was an engineer, not a real soldier. McClellan was pretty good at organizing stuff, though, so he massed a horde of men, and he launched a two-pronged attack on Virginia. 
um, mostly up the peninsula. And the situation got dire because McClellan managed to get right outside of Richmond, and then the Confederate commanding general Joseph E. Johnston was killed in action. Johnston's death caused a panic in the Confederate government, and if Richmond had fallen, then everything would have been over. However, Jefferson Davis turned to Robert E. Lee, and Lee took command of the Army of Northern Virginia and saved the South and made sure that the South put up a good fight. So he was appointed to command the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee went on to prove himself to be the best general of the war, and he went on to be honored as one of the six great captains. Lee never lost an engagement while in personal command, which is an incredible fact when you think about how evenly fought most musket battles were. So, of all the great captains, Napoleon, Caesar, Genghis Khan, all of them, Lee is probably the most skilled. Another interesting fact about Lee, um, and if you're interested in this, you can look at the video that I have on my channel already, is that Lee was actually a homosexual, but even though there was a huge bias against homosexuals in this era, he was such a well-respected man that no one gave him any grief over it, and people just accepted him for who he was for the most part. Since Virginia is by far the most important front, I think that it's worthwhile to look at some of the major commanders in Virginia. So let's look at Lee's three chief lieutenants. First, we have Stonewall Jackson, bold and brilliant. We've already looked at him at First Manassas. He'll continue to really make a name for himself over the course of the war. James Longstreet, slow and steady, but he generally got the job done. He was a good organizer. Jeb Stuart, dashing and daring, he was a great cavalry chief, and he let Lee know what was going on around him. Let's look at some of the Union opponents. There was Pope, who was a maniac and a moron. We'll talk about his you know, lack of intelligence when we look at Second Manassas. Reynolds, he was basically a watered-down Stonewall Jackson, so pretty good, but could have been better. And then Hancock, he was a watered-down Longstreet. Pretty good, but could have been better. Right after Lee took command, he started launching attacks on McClellan. McClellan had a nervous breakdown, panicked, and fled back north. So Lincoln relieved McClellan and replaced him with General Pope. Pope was like this real attention whore guy, and he told some newspapers that his headquarters was in the saddle and that he was a man of action. So when he went to Manassas Junction, he ran into Stonewall Jackson's corps. Stonewall had about half the Confederate Army and he launched an all-out attack on Jackson. So Stonewall and his men defended Manassas like a Stonewall against the entire Northern Army for an entire day. And then Longstreet arrived at the last minute and it was a complete rout. Um, so the Northern Army was completely defeated. And this is really one of the best examples of how the Southern soldiers were simply tougher and better at fighting than their Northern counterparts. Um, the biggest mistake that Lee made at this time, and one of his biggest mistakes for the entire war, actually, was not making an immediate march on Washington, D.C., after he had Pope on the run and completely disorganized. Lee did eventually invade the North. He attacked Maryland, and he settled into a town called Sharpsburg, where one of the most important battles in American history was destined to be fought. This battle is also called Antietam, that's what the Northerners call it after the name of the creek there. But most battles are named after towns, so I think that Sharpsburg is the more technically correct name for the battle. This is the bloodiest day in American history. Now, when McClellan eventually, McClellan had retaken command after Pope, because Pope had humiliated himself so severely, um, he attacked Lee, and he had a 3-1 to one numerical advantage, but he failed to dislodge him because Lee was a tactical genius, and because Lee had the advantage of having Jackson, Longstreet, and the valor of the Southern soldiers on his side. And this is really the best example of why Lee is so much better than McClellan. Lee could really read a field and make the appropriate decisions, he knew who to trust, and McClellan had no idea how to fight because he was an engineer. Um, now Lincoln actually went on to claim the battle as a victory because after the battle was fought, Lee left. However, it definitely wasn't a victory. The North lost a lot more men than the South, and McClellan was not able to rout Lee's much smaller army. So it was a pretty clear Southern victory, even if it didn't really gain the South all that much. But uh, Lincoln was still able to claim it as a victory anyway, and he used that to show his true colors. Let's talk about that. 
Shortly after claiming his little victory at Sharpsburg, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which said that all slaves in the United States or the Confederate States were now free men. And this more or less proves that all of the South's fears going into the war were completely correct, and that Lincoln actually was an abolitionist. And that the only real difference between Lincoln and John Brown is that John Brown was a crazy person, whereas Lincoln was a calculating and sophisticated opponent of the South. Um, so this is proof, if any proof was needed, that Lincoln had intended all along to crush the Southern freedom and way of life. And once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, this meant that there was no chance now of a negotiated peace, that the South and North couldn't reach a peace agreement and live uh, separately or reintegrate in some way. So Lincoln really was a terrible diplomat in, a, in addition to being a radical abolitionist. So after Lee left Maryland, he retreated to Virginia and regrouped the Army of Northern Virginia, and they concentrated at Fredericksburg. This was a great position, it was well fortified, and the new Union General Burnsides, he replaced McClellan, attacked this great position, and not surprisingly, he lost. This was an easy, glorious victory for the South, and it really broke Northern morale in the Army of the Potomac for quite a while. It would be a long time before the Northern Army was truly combat effective again. Fredericksburg had been fought in late 1862, and now in the spring of 1863, the next battle, Chancellorsville, was fought. At this time, Lee had had to send away Longstreet with about a third or more of the army in order to get provisions from elsewhere. So that meant that he was now confronted with a large Union army under General Hooker, who gave his name to prostitutes, that's why we called them hookers, because Hooker himself was a connoisseur of women of the evening. Anyway, um, so Lee had about two-thirds of his army, but he still had Stonewall Jackson, and they were confronting the Union in a heavily forested area near Chancellorsville. And remember, the Southerners are men who live in rural areas and are farmers, so they're really accustomed to the woods and know how to get around, whereas most of the Northerners come from cities, and they really are lost and afraid of the woods. So what Stonewall Jackson does is he, take, he launches a large flank attack and this takes the Union off guard, and the men in the Union Army panic, and they start running away. Um, now, this would have been a complete, total victory, except that as dusk was falling, Stonewall Jackson was accidentally shot by one of his own men. He was mortally wounded, and he died. And he was the best Confederate Corps commander in the war on any front, but also in Virginia. And his loss alone would really lessen the chance of the South winning. Um, we'll talk about at Gettysburg how things would have been a lot different had Stonewall Jackson been alive. But first, let's go west and see what's been going on over there. The most famous Union general of the war was Ulysses S. Grant, and he earned his reputation by beating up weaklings in the Western theater. As I mentioned earlier, the West was a sideshow and all the real action was in northern Virginia. However, Grant was able to become famous by winning battles when his eastern colleagues like McClellan were getting their asses handed to them by Robert E. Lee. So he became famous because he captured a couple of isolated river forts, like Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, uh, two forts that were held by weak militias and backed up by a minuscule Confederate river navy. So not really the most impressive victories, but a victory is a victory, and if you're someone like Abraham Lincoln, you can use that to create a hero that the public can rally around. And so Lincoln did that. He took Grant and made him a hero. Now Grant was a Republican, which means that he was a supporter of Lincoln from day one, and they were both hardcore abolitionists. However, Grant was also liberal, and he was a pretty bad alcoholic. So he was a good general. I mean, I, I'll give him that. He's not a great tactician and Lee would made her later make him look like an idiot, but as long as it was before noon and he hadn't had um, enough, you know, a lot of liquor, he wasn't a bad general. Arguably, the best known of all the battles in the Western theater occurred at a place called Shiloh, and this is a battle where General Beauregard almost ruined Grant's reputation and removed him from the war. So what happened is that Beauregard launched a surprise attack where Grant was caught off guard and during the first day, Beauregard had really limited Grant to a little place called Pittsburgh Landing, and he had him surrounded. 
But then on the second day, a second Union army, which had been running late under a Union general named Rosecrans, arrived, and he managed to save Grant. Now, Grant did take a hit from this, and it would be a while before his reputation would recover, but he did obviously recover in due time. However, despite the fact that Beauregard had come very close to winning what would have been the most brilliant victory of the war to date, he was unfairly blamed by Jefferson Davis for being outnumbered, and he was replaced with Braxton Bragg, who was considerably less talented. Here are two pictures of Beauregard, who I feel is a massively underrated general, and had he been allowed to command in the West uninterrupted, he would have been the Lee of the West. Grant's most famous battle was at a place called Vicksburg, and this is a big fort city on the Mississippi River. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the major fronts of the war was trying to control the Mississippi River, and this is the last major battle in that um, campaign. So what happens is that there's a small Confederate army under a general named Pemberton, which is blundering about, and he is supposed to defend this city of Vicksburg. There's also another small army under General Beauregard. Um, Jefferson Davis wouldn't just give command to Beauregard, which he should have done. Had Beauregard been in full command, this would have never happened. Anyway, so Pemberton went into Vicksburg for some reason. Grant was able to lay siege to him from the sea, or, I mean from the river and from land. And then Beauregard didn't have enough men to relieve the siege. So that meant that Grant captured Vicksburg and that completed the conquest of the Mississippi. Now, this was a victory which had large propaganda impact. This meant that now Grant was a national hero because he had won a complete theater in the war. But he had done so by only fighting either dummies like Pemberton or by fighting militias like he had done at Fort Donaldson or by fighting good generals who had no support like Beauregard. So his reputation was largely undeserved, but because he had gotten to fight so many battles without getting relieved, he had honed his skills a little bit. Now, I would also point out that Vicksburg itself was a complete shithole, and it still is. But, and it also wasn't very important, because New Orleans had already fallen and Memphis had already fallen. So at this point, this was the only point in the river that the Union didn't control, and they actually could have gone without taking the city if they wanted to. But it had a lot of propaganda value, and it helped really to demoralize some people in the South. So let's get back to Virginia. Now, about this point, Lee had amassed his forces after Chancellorsville, and a lot of men had poured in who had previously not given their support to the war because they were inspired by Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. So Lee now had the largest army he would ever command. It was about 75,000 men, and he decided that the time had come to invade the North once again. So he decided to invade Pennsylvania. Um, on the other side, the Union Army of the Potomac followed him, and now it was under the command of a general named George Snapping Turtle Meade who had 85,000 men, which was probably about a record low for the Army of the Potomac at this point. So this was a three-day battle fought in a town called Gettysburg. Um, the Confederates had tried to seize it because it had a small shoe factory, and then the Union had responded and tried to um, hold a position called Cemetery Ridge. So on days one and two, the Confederates are attacking on the flanks and gaining ground, but they hadn't won anything too decisive. The North was actually fighting really well in this battle for a change because they were defending their homeland and because they thought that if they lost the battle then everything would end because Lee would then march on Washington and end the war. So days one and two were hard, hard fought but the Confederates were gaining little uh, footholds here and there. And then on day three, this should have been the moment where Lee won his greatest victory. Um, so even though days one and two hadn't been ideal, he had still gained a lot of ground on the flanks and had he managed to break the center of the Union line, then what would have happened is the whole Union army would be trapped in between Lee's forces, and then he'd take a lot of prisoners, capture a lot of weapons, the Union army would be basically disintegrated, and he could march right on Washington in the war in a stroke. However, the problem is that Lee himself was ill, and he had to entrust the attack to General Longstreet, who was a great defender, but didn't know how to attack because he couldn't think fast enough. So Longstreet ordered what became known as Pickett's Charge, and this charge was undermanned and it didn't have enough manpower to break through the position at Cemetery Ridge. So instead of breaking through this position and then really capturing a large portion of the Army of the Potomac, instead 
uh, Longstreet took a few divisions of infantry and hurled them, and then they got torn to shreds by Union artillery. So um, this ended up being a great defeat, and this is probably the greatest battle that the Union fought. This was the only time where the Union would really beat Lee and also inflict heavy casualties on him in one single battle where it's clear that the Confederacy did not win the battle. So um, this by far is the greatest victory that the North won, and it's sort of a weird irony that although Meade won the battle, he was not given much credit because then Grant was sent to replace him almost immediately because Gettysburg and Vicksburg happened at the same exact time. Both of them were fought in early June 1863, and uh, Grant got all the credit because he was a friend of Lincoln, whereas Meade was relegated to being a chief of staff for Grant. Let's return to the West. Now, after Jefferson Davis decided to give command of the Army of Tennessee to Braxton Bragg in lieu of giving it to the much more talented General Beauregard, um, the Confederates had basically been pushed out of Tennessee except for the southeastern corner. Um, so after Gettysburg, Longstreet's Corps was sent to Tennessee to really bolster Bragg. Um, this would happen in September of 1863. And then this combined Confederate force would launch a counterattack at a place called Chickamauga. And this would be a big victory. It also is the only victory by Braxton Bragg. Now, this victory was immediately negated when the Union received huge reinforcements. So the Confederacy gained the town of Chickamauga and a couple of small mountains, but it didn't really gain all that much in the long run. And then Longstreet had to return to Virginia in 1864 several thousand men the poorer because of the casualties incurred at Chickamauga and its aftermath. So after Chickamauga, um, Bragg steadily lost ground and eventually um, in early 1864 William Tecumseh Sherman, who was once a lieutenant of Grant, took command of the Union Army and invaded Georgia. Um, Sherman was mentally unstable, brutal, and a rabid hater of the South, but he was a pretty good general or at least he was better than Braxton Bragg. So he marched from Atlanta, which he captured early in his campaign, and then he marched all the way to the coast of Georgia and through the Carolinas, burning down farms, freeing slaves, massacring civilians, just unleashing the real dogs of war like Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun. And then after, um, from 1864 to 1865, he marched um, from Savannah through the Carolinas, and he was just raising havoc and um, it was a fairly dishonorable campaign. He didn't fight a lot of battles, and uh, the real problem was that, um, you know, Bragg didn't really know how to lead an army, and eventually Jefferson Davis would be forced to relieve him, but then they didn't really find a suitable replacement, so they kept kind of getting stuck with Bragg over and over and over, and uh, Jefferson Davis would never allow Beauregard to take command, and by the time that, you know, they came around to the idea like, hey, maybe we should put Beauregard in command, the army was basically reduced to nothing. So while Sherman was doing his march to the sea, Grant was doing the overland campaign where he took a massive army of the Potomac from Washington DC to Richmond. And this campaign was a lot different than previous marches on Richmond because Grant was not looking for one decisive battle. What he wanted to do was to take his army and hurl it against Lee over and over and over and hope that he had more men than Lee had musket balls. So that was basically his strategy. He was basically doing what the Soviets would do to the Germans in World War II and what the Chinese have done to every opponent they've ever fought in their entire history. So pretty basic strategy, just pure attrition. Um, now the goal was to, over time, destroy Lee's army, capture Richmond, and then win the war while Sherman was serving as a distraction in the South because the thought was if Sherman is raising hell in the South, then some of the men from Lee's army might desert to go fight Sherman or there might be pressure on Jefferson Davis to send some of Lee's men south to help out uh, Bragg. But that didn't really happen, and ultimately Sherman was just a, was just a sideshow while Grant, you know, in fact won the war. I'm not going to go through all of the battles of the Overland Campaign, but I'm going to cover a couple of the more interesting ones. First up is the Battle of the Wilderness. At the Wilderness, this is an area very close to Chancellorsville, so it's also a thickly forested area. And because Lee knew that northern troops were not accustomed to the forest and that they didn't have the same uh, regard for nature that the southern troops had, he decided to attack Grant while he was in this thick forest. And because this was um, in the early spring, 
uh, a, or a big fire broke out because of all of the sparks by the muskets. So, in the end, the Confederates were able to win once again because they were more able to fight in a forest, but they didn't win decisively, so Grant was able to push on because, one, he had a lot of men, and two, he didn't care about casualties. So, uh, one of the big downsides for this battle is that, just like at Chancellorsville, Lee lost someone very important to him. So Longstreet, during his battle, took a musket ball, and he would be out of action for most of the rest of the war, and he wouldn't come back until pretty late. And he was too late to make a difference, as was his reputation for being slow. The Overland Campaign after the Wilderness was basically Lee taking up a fortified position in front of Grant, and then Grant slamming his army into it, losing a battle, and then marching around Lee. And the best example of that occurred at a place called Cold Harbor. This was probably the third or fourth battle of the Overland Campaign. So Grant is blundering around northern Virginia, attacking all of Lee's positions, and he managed to find one at Cold Harbor. Now, at the time, Lee wasn't aware that he was in possession of one of the best defensive positions in human history. So uh, Lee took up a position, it was foggy, and then Grant didn't know that Lee's whole army was there, so he sent out his troops in order to try to clear away what he assumed was just the division. And uh, these guys marched in to the teeth of Lee's army and got torn up. Grant lost several thousand men in just a few hours. And uh, this was a thoroughly humiliating loss, and it made Grant look like a complete moron. Um, however, Grant pushed on because he had a horde of Irish, Germans, and freed slaves to send into the teeth of Lee's army. Um, so even though Lee won numerically the most impressive victory of the Civil War, it really didn't help him because Grant just kept moving, and then Lee had to abandon his position and find a new one to try to block Grant's advance. Eventually, the Overland Campaign settled down into two sieges, one at Richmond and another, more important one, at Petersburg. Petersburg is a city to the south of Richmond, and this became the main focus of Grant's efforts to take Richmond. Now, the commander here ultimately would be General A.P. Hill, who was a brave and semi-talented general. However, the original commander for Petersburg was actually General Beauregard, but then he was relieved by Jefferson Davis because Jefferson Davis couldn't allow Beauregard to be in charge of anything. Um, Beauregard had actually been defeating Union troops in the area when he was relieved by Hill. So it's hard to say what would have happened had Beauregard remained in command at Petersburg, but he would have definitely done a better job than A.P. Hill. No offense to A.P. Hill. So once the siege settled down, the Union started launching all kinds of cockamamie schemes to take Petersburg. There was one which occurred which is known as the Battle of the Crater. And what happened is a bunch of Pennsylvania, mi Pennsylvania miners were told to dig a tunnel under the Confederate lines and then blow something up. So they did. And when they blew this big hole in the ground, it opened up a crater um, on the Confederate side of the lines. It didn't really take out all that many Confederates, though. So what happened is then an Alabama unit responded and surrounded the crater, and as the miners tried to come out and take over the Confederate lines, they were just cut down and stabbed with bayonets. So the Union lost a couple thousand men, and the attempt was a complete failure. Now, Petersburg would eventually be starved out. A lot of men would die over the winter or desert or whatever. And then the Confederates would regroup, the, both the Confederates at Petersburg and Richmond, and they would try to break out in March of 1865. So as Lee and his men retreated to the west, they were eventually cornered at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. And on April 9, 1865, Lee's exhausted, starving, and greatly reduced force was cornered and cut off from any further retreat. Lee agreed to surrender to save his brave soldiers, but within just a few years, he rued that decision as northern tyranny in the form of Reconstruction continued, and it was as if the Civil War had never been fought because the North continued to dominate politics and dictate terms to the South. While Lee's surrender marked the end of the only army in the Confederacy which had ever truly mattered, there were other Confederates who held out in other places for a little longer. In Texas, for instance, the last Confederate forces didn't hold out until 1866, and those forces still believed in states' rights and held slaves, so it's actually 1866, which is also the official end of slavery in the United States. Anytime we look at the War of Northern Aggression, we should ask ourselves, will the South rise again? The conditions that we see around us today are very similar to the ones leading up to the Civil War, 
Obama-era pro-Islamic policy really alienated the Christian South, and we see that continuing to play out. 2016 would have been a good time for the South to rise again if Hillary had been elected. Um, the South does not like Hillary Clinton, and she does not represent our values. To avoid another civil war, the North really needs to learn to respect Southern culture and Southern liberty. If they don't, then we might be forced to fight another civil war, and this time the South won't go down.